Coming up, Mason and company get life in prison, but everyone else gets away free and clear. And a nominee for ambassador to Belize who doesn't like poor people? You're listening to Brent's Two Cents, the semi-serious thoughts of a guy in Belize. And now here's the host of this podcast from somewhere in Belize City, Brent Toombs. Hey, welcome to the podcast for the week of August the 3rd, or as I'm calling it, the 34th day of Rumspringa in Belize. Rumspringa! Woo! <laughs> Uh, I want to give a shout out to Julie, a regular listener of the podcast in Placencia, who messaged me to let me know she really enjoyed the recommendation for watching the movie Sex Drive. So Julie, I'm glad you enjoyed the movie and thank you very much for listening to the podcast. Oh, and Julie also says that she agrees with me that people in Belize are behaving like we're on Rumspringer. Well, you know who's not going to be celebrating anything close to Rumspringa for at least the next three decades? That'd be Mr. William Danny Mason. Convicted murderer Danny Mason is going to be in prison until at least the year 2051. Mason and three of his co-convicts were sentenced to life in prison with no eligibility for parole for 35 years for the murder and beheading of Pastor Llewellyn Lucas in 2016. The fourth and youngest member of the killing crew, Ernest Castillo, could be eligible for parole in only 30 years. The four years that everyone has already spent on remand will be deducted from their sentences. So if Mason manages to live long enough, he will be at least 82 years old before he ever tastes freedom again. Now for the family, and no doubt all of Belize, it gives some comfort to know that these five heinous murderers will pay for their crimes, something that happens less than 10% of the time in our judicial system. But is justice really being fully served now that Danny Mason is cooling his well-connected heels at Her Majesty's Central Prison? Certainly, there must be some very big men in Belize who probably had their best night of sleep in over four years once Mason quietly returned to Hattieville to begin serving his life sentence. However, I'm sure many of them will still sleep with one eye open, at least for the next few weeks, while Mason ponders whether or not to appeal. And if he does, what dirt might he expose? You see, there is an entire other side to the Mason story that is being conveniently swept under the rug now that justice appears to have been handed down for Pastor Lou's murder. Like, how the hell did Mason, which is not even his real name, manage to ingratiate himself with so many power brokers in Belize, including ministers of government and commanders of Belize's security forces, including the GSU? How did a person from Guyana, of Indian descent, obtain a birth certificate that claimed he was born William Alexander Mason in Crooked Tree on February 7, 1970? Did nobody at Vital Statistics question how an East Indian could be the natural-born child of a Creole mother named Tillett and a father named Mason, which is certainly not an Indian surname? Did nobody ever check his passport, issued in Guyana to Rajesh Ulet, that said he was born in Georgetown, Guyana on February 1, 1970? A different country, on a different day, and with a different name. I am sure that before Mason was able to convert his bogus birth paper into a plethora of Belizean ID, that there would have been times when he should have been asked to produce a second piece of identification to prove that he was who he claimed to be. So if he applied for a Belizean social security card or a Belizean passport, did nobody at either of those agencies bother to scrutinize this person? This Indian guy who claimed to be a natural born Belizean yet never set foot in our country until sometime in 2013, who definitely does not talk like a Belizean and does not even have a common Belizean surname. Mason even managed to get gun licenses, which as any honest person can tell you, is not an easy process. And would be impossible without both a Belizean social security card and a Belize passport or nationality certificate. Yet our commissioner of police signed off on gun licenses for William Danny Mason of Crooked Tree, the East Indian with a Guyanese accent who, according to some who knew Mason and his wife, 
was also claiming to be a citizen of Canada. Obviously, neither Belize's commissioner of police nor anyone involved in the administration of licensing firearms in this country bothered to do a cursory check on the applicant. If they had, they would have at least hit a dead end for William Danny Mason, which would have necessitated a deeper investigation. Or they would have discovered what I was able to find out thanks to five minutes on Google. William Danny Mason was known under a number of different names. Raj Ouellette, Danny Ouellette, Ted Ouellette, Ramish Ouellette, and even Danny Ferguson. A quick search on the internet and you will learn about various scams that him and his wife Melissa Ferguson ran in Canada and Guyana. You will also learn that in 2010, the Canadian government expelled Rajesh Ouellette for being convicted of an illegal firearms offence. That's right, Mason got kicked out of Canada for a gun crime, yet was granted gun licenses in Belize with no questions asked. So why no questions for Mr. Mason? Well, most likely, it's because of who his friends were. We know Mason was tight with then Minister of National Security John Saldiver. Saldiver admitted that Mason had invested in his semi-pro football team. When pressed to disclose the amount of said investment, Saldiver told reporters it was, quote, more than $50,000 in cash. Cash. Once again, we are expected to believe that benevolent businessmen prefer to support campaigns or sports teams with bags of cash. It's almost like banks don't exist in Belize for some people. Well, I'm calling bullshit on that. Honest people do not conduct business transactions with bags of cash, and any politician that claims to believe otherwise is either too stupid or too corrupt to hold office in this country. Another politician, Frank Papamena, admitted to receiving $10,000 in cash from Mason. He later promised to return the money, which must have been problematic, as if it was indeed campaign financing, that 10 k would have been spent during the 2015 election, right? The current leader-elect of the UDP, Patrick Faber, claims not to have had any relationship with Mason and denied allegations made by Mason himself that he received campaign donations. Yet one of the first things Faber did after being sworn in as Deputy Prime Minister of Belize on June 7, 2016, was to attend a social event at Danny Mason's house. On what was the biggest day of his political career to that point, the Deputy Prime Minister of Belize chose to celebrate his moment with William Danny Mason. Less than six weeks later, Mason and his crew murdered Pastor Lucas. Other regular guests at the Mason properties were members of Belize's law enforcement community, including former commander of the gang suppression unit, Mark Flowers. So clearly Danny Mason was well-connected and well-protected. He used his money to buy status in Belize and to create cover for his shady activities. And yet, of all the people who have been implicated for enabling Mason to obtain fake identity or operate with impunity, or at the very least enjoy privileges that ordinary, honest Belizeans could never expect, only four people, aside from the Danny Mason Five, have been penalized at all. Four low-level employees of the Vital Statistics Unit were terminated in December of 2018 for their role in supplying Rajesh Ouellette, or whoever the hell he is, with a bogus birth certificate in the name of William Alexander Mason. Four people fired. That's it. No criminal charges. And I wouldn't be surprised if they've all been quietly rehired by some other government ministry by now. And that's why I question whether or not justice has been served in the murder of Llewellyn Lucas. Maybe for Pastor Lou's family, but certainly not for Belize. Not as long as nobody is made to pay for letting Mason worm his way into Belize and cheat and scam and buy politicians and police and quickly get so high on himself that he actually thought he could cut the head off of a person and drive around with it in the back of his pickup truck. He believed he was untouchable because he had paid for that privilege. And every person who took his donations or signed off on an application for something because it came from the associate of a government minister or turned a blind eye or just abandoned common sense and never bothered to question how Rajesh, Ted, Danny, William, Ouellette, 
He of Indian descent and hailing from Guyana and Canada could also be the natural born son of Sharon Tillett and James Mason from Crooked Tree Belize. You all have a bit of Llewellyn Lucas's blood on your hands. Now, not every carpetbagger who washes up on our shores and bribes their way into Belizean society is going to be a murderer. But anyone who uses bags of cash and other gifts to quickly climb the social ladder has to be considered a person of dubious character. And it's time our politicians, our security officers, and even our public officers start using basic common sense to stop expecting us to believe that they never imagined there might be something fishy about Danny Mason or David Nain Schnitzer or Wan Hong Kim or dozens of other criminals and con artists who have tarnished Belize. This is why a wee bit of hustling at vital statistics and immigration is a huge deal. This is why the Senate Select Inquiry final report should not be left to simply collect dust until the next time a passport or visa scandal breaks. Corruption is killing Belize, and it won't stop until powerful people start paying for their crimes against society. Corruption should be listed as one of the causes of death for Pastor Llewellyn Lucas. We want to hear from you. You can find Brent's Two Cents on Twitter and Facebook at Two Cents Belize or email us at podcast at oshaproductions.com. That's O X A Productions with an S dot com. My grandmother was not a highly educated woman, but she told me as a small child to quit feeding stray animals. You know why? Because they breed. You're facilitating the problem. If you give an animal or a person ample food supply, they will reproduce. Especially one that don't think too much further than that. That clip you just heard was from former Lieutenant Governor of South Carolina, Andre Bauer, recorded in 2010. And to be clear about what you just heard, Bauer is comparing poor people to stray animals and suggesting that feeding hungry animals or hungry people only encourages breeding. He made those comments at a town hall meeting where the issue being discussed was whether or not to provide subsidized or free school lunches to needy children. He was not concerned about the cost or whether the state of South Carolina could afford this type of safety net. No, Andre Bauer opposed feeding poor children because doing so would encourage poor people to breed. Just like stray animals. So why am I playing a 10-year-old clip from some guy in South Carolina? Well, late last month, President Donald Trump nominated Andre Bauer for the post of U.S. Ambassador to Belize. Yes, you heard that right. Trump wants his top representative to a country where at least 40% of the population live in poverty to be someone who has expressed such heartless disdain for the poor. Since independence, Belize has enjoyed fantastic relationships with various U.S. ambassadors, appointed under both Democrat and Republican administrations. People such as George Bruno, or Carolyn Curiel, or Carlos Moreno have remained loyal friends to our jewel long after leaving the diplomatic services in this country. The current charge de affaire, Keith Gilgas, in the absence of a full-time ambassador, has done an outstanding job representing his government for the past two years. Mr. Gilgis's affection for Belize and our people is obvious. The nomination of Andre Bauer is a slap in his face and in the faces of so many other American diplomats who have served their country in Belize with honor, humanity, and friendship. Now, it's the prerogative of any head of state to select their country's ambassador. That's not something we Belizeans get to decide. And while it could be technically possible for the Governor General of Belize to refuse to accept the credentials of Andre Bauer, in reality, that never happens in the world of international diplomacy. Certainly not for something like just being a jackass who thinks that starving poor people is the solution to poverty. And there's the possibility that with everything going on in the United States, that Bauer's nomination may not even get confirmed before the election this fall. And after November 3rd, Trump may be busy cleaning out his desk and issuing pardons, and the responsibility of selecting an ambassador to Belize will be on the to-do list of President-elect Joe Biden. 
But that doesn't mean we should just sit and hope for the best or quietly accept that if all the pieces somehow fall into place for Bauer, that the next ambassador to Belize would be someone whose moral compass is not calibrated with the reality of life for many citizens in this developing nation. Many Belizeans in the U.S. are dual citizens. They have every right to contact their congressional representatives and senators to voice their opinion about Bauer's nomination. I say regardless if a Belizean American supports Trump or not, they have a moral obligation to this country to demand that America send a more compassionate person to manage the relationship between our two nations. Belize is home to a large number of U.S. citizens who should also speak up. Some of those U.S. nationals are high-profile members of the religious community, such as Scott Sturm of the National Evangelical Association of Belize. Sturm and Nia have not hesitated to protest against Uncle Sam in the past, for example, when they took offense to a pride flag being flown on embassy grounds. So will they now speak up on behalf of 40% of the population? Do I need to remind Pastor Sturm that Jesus commands his church to feed the poor? For the rest of us, there's no reason why we can't make a bit of noise ourselves. After all, this is our country. And maybe if we make it known that a person with such disdain for the poor won't be made to feel very welcome in a country where so many people are struggling to feed their families, just maybe that sentiment will trickle up to the ears of a very tone-deaf president. Or at least someone with access to those tone-deaf ears. The U.S. Embassy in Belize does listen to the streets and social media. I'm sure our true friends inside that diplomatic mission on Floral Park Road in Belopan will take note of local reaction if we speak up against Andre Bauer's nomination. Our duty, then, is to give them something to communicate back to Washington. And finally, before I wrap up this episode of the podcast, a bit of good news. Actually, I would file this story under great news. Many of you may be familiar with Clayton C. Wills Williams, a griffin and musician and perendero from Hopkins Village. But what you may not know is that he is also the author of a wonderful illustrated children's book. C. Wills and his wife Kayla have created Paranda Boy, a magical story about embracing your culture and chasing after your dreams. Paranda Boy launches on August 14th, and I had the pleasure to speak to C. Wills, who is currently in the United States, about the book. So in this book, Paranda Boy, you know, as we know that he, he loved his Garifuna culture, and he wanted to be a singer, just like Aurelio Martinez, uh, the late, great Paul Nabor, Andy Palacio. So Paranda Boy tell his uncle, his uncle, who, who he's very close with, he tell him, like, I want to be a singer. I want to sing Garifuna Paranda music. So his uncle then gave him this guitar, which he told him, this is a magical guitar. And he told him, make sure you close your eyes. Every time you sing, close your eyes. Every time you play this guitar, you close your eyes, and you will go to different places. So it actually worked when he did it the first time. <laughs> And from then, Paranda Boy was excited. He went to school, and all he was thinking about is, is this magical guitar and, and the music. And so he, he then tell his classmates, like, hey, guys, I want you guys to try this. Um, I, actually went to, I actually went to the United States. I actually went to Honduras. I actually went to Guatemala when I'm playing my guitar. So he, he, he had them try it, but it didn't work. Now he got he got frustrated. He went back to his uncle the, at that time and said, "Oh, this didn't work. What happened, right?" So he's like, "That was that was like his obstacle. Like that's that was like the time that he realized when he when his uncle tell him like, Paranda boy, did you close your eyes? Did they close their eyes? You know?" So he went back. His uncle was like, uh, "In life, you're gonna go to." You're gonna meet some obstacles on the way to get to your dreams, and you know. So he then went back to school. He tried it with his friends. They all they all went to different places, and you know. So it's just a book that about a kid that's always dreaming. 
So, C. Wells, why did you and, and your wife Kayla decide to create this book? We we were like looking at ways how we could, you know, connect with the younger generation, especially our Garifuna generation coming from small towns as Hopkins and she she from Honduras in a small town town called Bahamara. So it was like looking at ways like how can we improve them by like the reading and so on. Like, like how can we get them interested in the music and the culture and and this book plays a big part in that. So I believe we were just looking at like educating the kids and for them also to try to be like Paranda boy, like go through your dreams. Whatever your dream is, like go for it. It don't matter if you want to be a musician, whatever, a lawyer, a teacher. You just go for your dreams, you know? How much of Paranda Boy is just a, a, a product of your imagination and, and how much of it is actually Clayton Williams? Yeah, good question. So for me, uh, with this book, it tells a lot about my growing up also. Um, growing up into music. From young, I loved the music. I used to play Garifuna drums, which I still do play. Um, from from a very young age, actually, the same person we're using in the videos are persons that had an impact on my career co- growing up, you know? So just like the uncle, Uncle Jeremy, he's the guy who gave me my first guitar in real life, too. You know, and that's where I started to learn. I went to YouTube. I, I, I was, like, asking everybody, how do I play this? How can I how can I play a guitar? How What's this chord? What's... You know, I always tried to question stuff and growing up in my musical career as well, you know? I'm just, I'm something that's always fascinated me about Belize is the level of natural creative talent that exists in this country. Yeah, you, yeah. You just mentioned, you know, you're you're a self-taught guitarist and, and now you're one of, you know, you're recognized as one of, of Belize's best paranderos. What is it, what is it, what is it about Belizeans that they just seem to be able to, to embrace these creative arts without the formal training that may be available to them in other countries. Yeah, for real. So I believe like for us, Belizeans, like people just, we use what we have, you know, we don't have a, we, we couldn't go to a school that's okay. I'm, it's only music. That's I'm gonna go to a music school. We don't have that option in Belize. We don't have that option. Oh, I'm gonna go to school to play sports. I'm gonna go. So I believe that everybody just like with the talent within them, they just, Belizean just, you know, they just want to do it. And it don't matter how, they're going to figure it out, how to do it. <laughs> so I think it's the same way how I did it with, with, with playing a guitar, you know. I was playing with my drumming group from from I was 10 years old. Uh, playing, I was already the lead singer, so I already knew a lot of traditional music. I was singing and singing. And actually, I wanted to be a parandero. I love watching Andy Palacio. I love watching... Watching Paul Nabor, Aurelio Martinez, guys like these inspired me a lot. So for me, I really wanted to do paranga music. Hey, now the illustrations in the book are fantastic. Uh, I mean, I've been flipping through your Facebook page. You've got a lot of them there. I'll post links on my on my show notes and, and on my Facebook page so people can see Paranda Boy. The first thing that jumped into my mind when I saw the quality of the illustrations was that this has the potential to become an animated either feature film or TV series, you know, almost something like, almost something like Coco, you know, and, and that maybe there's the potential for Paranda Boy to do for Belize what Coco did for Mexico. Yeah, so we are looking into all the, you know, like the future of this with the book and Paranda Boy as a, as like for the future, we are looking at doing all that stuff, bringing him to life and, you know, try to do more with the book. So we, we will just see how it goes. Once we release the book, then we move forward from there, you know? Well, hopefully if anybody in the uh, entertainment industry is listening to this podcast, they should reach out. They should reach out to UC Wills and talk about optioning the rights to Brando Boy, because I think the potential is massive for what you're doing with with this this character and the story. The book will be available starting August the 14th. Let people know how they can get, how they can get a copy of Brando Boy. Um, they could go to the website. At my website, ClaytonWilliamsMusic.com, in the store part, you see Paranda Boy, where everything show up about Paranda Boy, and you can pre-order your book from now. That way you could get it as early as August August 14th. Fantastic. I'll be putting the links to uh, ClaytonWilliamsMusic.com in the show notes. So if you're listening to this podcast, just look at the show notes. You'll see a link there. 
Also, I'll put it on my Facebook page at Two Cents Belize. And of course, if you're on Facebook, just look for the Paranda Boy Facebook page. It's got videos. It's got pictures. Yeah, Facebook page. Yeah, follow the page. <laughs> All right, Seawills, thanks for taking time to talk to me about Paranda Boy. I think this is just an absolutely great story. And it's it's the type of story we need to hear more of in Belize because, you know what, in these difficult times, we need things like this to just lift our spirits and so I just want to congratulate you and your wife, Kayla, for what you're doing. Wish you all the success. The book will be shipping out on August 14th. You can get pre-orders in now. It's Paranda Boy. The links to the Facebook page and the website will be in my show notes and on my Facebook page. Seawills, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, before I go, just enough time to let you know about another Belizean podcast I think you should check out. It's called Two Can View and it's hosted by a real Lightfoot. Anyone who spends any time on the various Belize Facebook pages will probably be familiar with Aria. She lives in Florida and is quite active with the online diaspora community, but she also remains very involved with what's happening here at home, especially when it comes to social issues and politics, and her podcast definitely reflects that. She doesn't seem to have a regular schedule for when episodes are published, but there are quite a few episodes already online and Aria tells me that there will be more coming soon. So that's definitely a good reason to subscribe to Two Can View wherever you get your podcasts so you won't miss any future episodes. And that's a wrap for episode five of Brent's Two Cents. Don't forget, you can hit me up with comments on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at Two Cents Belize. I'd love to hear what's on your mind and especially encourage you to leave a WhatsApp voice message that I can play back during next week's podcast. The link for that is on the Facebook page for Brent's Two Cents. Be sure to subscribe to this show wherever you get your podcasts. You can find Brent's Two Cents on all the major platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and the rest. By subscribing, you make sure that you never miss an episode. And when you wake up each Monday, this show will already be in your device and you can listen to it whenever and wherever you feel like it. And finally, if you enjoy this show, please help spread the word about Brent's Two Cents. Facebook ads are okay, but they get expensive. And quite frankly, there is no better advertising than word of mouth. So please recommend this podcast to at least one person who otherwise may not know about it. That's how you can help grow the audience for this show, which will keep me motivated to continue creating this labor of love I call Brent's Two Cents. Until next week, stay safe, wash your hands, wear your mask, and most importantly, be nice to each other. Brent's Two Cents is a presentation of OSHA Productions, Belize's affordable professional video production company.